Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is James Mackler. I'm an attorney here with Frost Brown Todd. Uh, thank you for joining me for this webinar, uh, an overview of UAS law. As you can see from the screen in front of you, there are a number of ways that you can contact me uh, by email or Twitter. And of course, uh, you can call me at the office anytime you like with any questions. Before we get started, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself and uh, why I'm qualified to teach this subject. I've been practicing law for about 20 years, uh, but I took some time off from the practice of law to fly helicopters for the Army. I was a Black Hawk pilot for several years, uh, and in addition to being a military aviator, I'm a uh, civilian-rated commercial helicopter pilot and hold a private pilot's license. Uh, when I was flying in Iraq in 2006, that was my first interaction with unmanned aircraft. Uh, we uh, got used to their capabilities and got used to incorporating uh, unmanned aircraft into our risk planning process. And so I became very aware of, um, in the military context, of the benefits and risks of drones and very comfortable operating around them. When I transitioned into private practice uh, in 2011, the commercial drone industry was just beginning to develop. And so at that time, I began to develop a practice focused on the use of unmanned aircraft. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'll be using the terms unmanned aircraft and drones interchangeably. I'll probably use drones for the most part. It's easier to say. Uh, and I, I don't, um, you know, some people feel that the term drone is maybe a loaded term in some way. Uh, I don't really necessarily feel that way. I'll just be talking about both interchangeably. Okay. So drones have a variety of potential commercial applications. Uh, this is a list of some of the most common ones, but uh, really one of the most interesting things about this area is that anytime I speak to a subject matter expert in, any in really any industry or field, they come up with ideas and applications for drones that I could have never thought of. Uh, the ones that I see most commonly, though, are mapping, along with surveying, uh, agricultural analysis, disaster response, infrastructure inspection, law enforcement, videography, and conservation. Uh, and I'll go into each of those in a little bit more detail. Uh, mapping is a, is a common use. Uh, surveying and mapping companies can put an unmanned aerial uh, system or an unmanned aerial vehicle in the air and develop very accurate uh, 3D maps using a number of different uh, technologies, including LIDAR, Similar to that, uh, farmers uh, have found that they can uh, use their drones in support of precision agriculture. Uh, there are several companies out there right now that are flying drones over farms, and through the use of uh, near-infrared technology, the drone can detect uh, and assess crop health and uh, alert a farmer very quickly if there is a problem with a plant, whether it's insufficient water or uh, insufficient nutrients or a pest, or an invasive plant species, or even broken equipment such as a sprinkler system, allowing them to respond very quickly to those threats uh, and um, increase their yields or decrease their uh, resource inputs. And in an industry like farming, uh, those very small changes on the margins can really uh, have a very large impact on the bottom line. So agriculture is probably the biggest use right now for unmanned aircraft. Uh, the other thing about agriculture is that a lot of the concerns about privacy and safety that some people have surrounding the use of drones don't really apply as much to large agricultural plots. Obviously, you're not flying over people, and so the privacy and safety issues are reduced. Disaster response is another uh, great use for drones. An unmanned aircraft can be set up to detect hydrocarbons or other hazardous materials. It can survey accident scenes to determine what emergency resources need to be deployed. Uh, it can be used in support of insurance industry inspections over a disaster or for uh, emergency responders. Uh, that similar, uh, in a similar way, infrastructure inspection, either after an event, uh, a drone can be used to inspect the um, uh, potential damage to, to a cooling tower or water tower or a uh, power line or power pole or a dam. Uh, 
or for routine inspection rather than companies putting individuals up on ladders or scaffolds or down on ropes. Uh, it's a lot less expensive and a lot safer to put a drone with a high definition camera up along a dam, for example, and to check uh, the infrastructure there. Law enforcement use is a very important drone application, but it's also one of the more controversial uses if we're talking about surveillance. Uh, many states have passed laws specifically restricting the use of drones for surveillance, requiring that a warrant be obtained prior to any surveillance being conducted with an unmanned aircraft. Uh, I'm going to get some more into the law enforcement use of unmanned aircraft later in this uh, presentation. Uh, other law enforcement uses, such as uh, taking pictures of accident scenes, are less controversial and uh, still extremely helpful. Videography, particularly in the movie and uh, television production industries, uh, is an important use and was the first use to be approved commercially by the FAA. Uh, approximately a year ago, maybe a little more now, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration approved the first seven commercial use applications known as 333 exemptions, all for uh, videography and cinematography companies working with Hollywood Studios. Uh, one of those companies uh, is actually based here in Nashville uh, and, and is a client, and um, that continues to be a, a, an important use for unmanned aircraft. And then conservation, I put that there to, to give another example of a very positive use case. Uh, I have a client now, Frost Brown Todd has a client that uses drones to assess whale health. Uh, they, they fly the drones off of a boat in the ocean over a whale, and when the whale spouts, uh, the drone can actually collect uh, the water uh, that, that, the, that the whale has spouted and um, use that to assess the health of the whale, its DNA, and um, basically use that for ocean conservation purposes. The focus of this talk is going to be primarily the commercial use of unmanned aircraft. There's a lot of misinformation in this area, and uh, I, I still hear from a lot of people that they believe commercial use is a gray area and that they can use their drone commercially without FAA approval if they meet certain conditions or if certain circumstances uh, apply. And, uh, and so they um, are reluctant to hire counsel or to seek FAA approval because they want to wait until things are kind of clarified. They, they, again, they say this is a gray area. The FAA has put a statement on its website directly addressing this, which they refer to as a myth. Uh, the FAA's position is that there are no shades of gray in FAA regulations. Anyone who wants to fly an aircraft, manned or unmanned, in U.S. airspace needs some level of FAA approval. Now, that does apply to commercial use, uh, that there needs to be some level of FAA approval. For hobby or model aircraft use, uh, there isn't a requirement for FAA approval at this time, although there is a uh, a requirement to register your aircraft, and that's something we'll get into later. But the take-home point here is that currently the commercial use of unmanned aircraft is not a gray area. The commercial use of unmanned aircraft is prohibited by the FAA unless you receive specific FAA approval uh, for that commercial use. And uh, there are significant uh, civil penalties, up to $10,000 per flight, uh, for an un unauthorized commercial use of an unmanned aircraft. Uh, there are also possible criminal penalties under both the federal and a number of state laws. And uh, using a, uh, an aircraft for commercial use in violation of FAA regulations raises the very real possibility that in the event of an accident, there won't be insurance coverage. And that's one of the biggest things I always try to stress to my clients is uh, particularly if they, they sort of have the attitude that they won't get caught and so they're not that worried about it, I like to point out that they may be paying for insurance uh, for their drone operations, and if they're operating in violation of the law, uh, the odds are very good that uh, there's a, uh, not going to be coverage. There'll be an exclusion within their policy for unlawful operations. So uh, this isn't really, this is not purely academic. This is a matter of following the law, and it's a matter of ensuring uh, that you have coverage. So uh, commercial use uh, can be done and is being done in a variety of areas, but it needs to be done with FAA approval. I'm going to cover a number of topics in this webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about hobby use and the distinction between hobby use and commercial use, because that's uh, very important in the law. We're going to talk about certificates of authorization. 
and, and what those mean particularly for public entities. I'm going to discuss the exemption process. This is currently the only or really one of the only ways for a commercial entity uh, to use drones is through an exemption process. I'm going to discuss the Pathfinder program. That's a program the FAA has put into effect to help develop new technologies and procedures. Uh, we will talk about the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Uh, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or the NPRM, is the FAA's direction uh, or their, their proposed rule as to uh, the commercial use of unmanned aircraft that should be put into effect in the near future. And I'm going to cover state law. Uh, state law is an important and growing aspect of unmanned aircraft regulation. There are a lot of state laws that often conflict with each other and with federal law, and so it's important to have a decent understanding of what some of those laws are. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is hobby use, uh, hobby versus commercial use. As I've already mentioned, the um, FAA requires that anyone operating commercially obtain some form of approval from the FAA. Uh, however, if something is hobby use, that is if you're flying a model aircraft, uh, then FAA approval is not required so long as uh, you fly within certain recommended guidelines and are flying in a safe way, that is not flying carelessly or recklessly. The FAA has put out some guidance as to what constitutes uh, hobby use versus commercial use, and this is defined very, very strictly by the Federal Aviation Administration. They've given us some examples which frankly uh, are confusing to some people in the sense that you sort of wonder why, uh, why it would matter, uh, and, and you'll see in a minute. Uh, anything that could po potentially earn money for the operator is really going to be considered commercial use. If there's no possible way to monetize that flight, then it's probably going to be considered a hobby use. So here are some examples. Uh, that the FAA has given of uh, hobby use, flying a model aircraft at the local model air cl aircraft club. That is the, uh, the traditional long-standing model airplane, model aircraft use, uh, going out to a model aircraft club uh, and flying a model airplane that's been done for many, many years. Another example is taking photographs with a model aircraft. As long as those photographs are for personal use only, uh, Likewise, a person photographing a property or an event uh, without any sort of compensation, strictly for personal use, uh, can fall within that hobby category. Using a model aircraft to move a box from point to point without any kind of compensation. This uh, would be one of the strangest hobbies I uh, can really imagine, but if, in fact, you are using a model aircraft to move a box around and no one's paying you, then that's potentially a hobby use. And viewing a field to determine whether crops need water when they're grown, and here's the important point, when they're grown for personal enjoyment. And you'll see why that's important in just a second. Uh, the following categories constitute commercial use. Receiving money for demonstrating aerobatics with a model aircraft. A realtor using a model aircraft to photograph a property that he is trying to sell and using those photos in the property's real estate listing a person photographing a property or event and selling the photos, using a model aircraft to move a box from point to point for compensation, delivering packages for a fee, and then finally, determining whether crops need to be watered that are grown as part of a commercial farming operation. So as you can see, the exact same flight with the exact same operational parameters may be uh, non-commercial hobby use and therefore not subject to strict FAA regulations and not require prior approval, or if there's any way to receive money for the operation, falls into that other category of commercial use. Um, the FAA has gone so far as to send cease and desist letters to individuals who have posted videos on YouTube telling them to remove those videos because the FAA believes that, uh, and, and they're correct, that you can monetize a YouTube video, and so the FAA has taken the position that once a video is placed on YouTube, even if it was done during a model aircraft flight, it's now commercial use. So the question isn't just whether or not the uh, aircraft is being used uh, to generate income or not. There are other factors that are considered in determining whether or not this is strictly a hobby use. 
Um, it matters because commercial use is prohibited without approval. FAA regulatory authority over hobby use is limited to careless operation. Um, in order to qualify as hobby use or model aircraft, it must be flown only for recreation. That's the chart that I just went through. But, but the aircraft also must be operated in accordance with community guidelines, which are guidelines put out uh, by hobbyist associations. It has to weigh under 55 pounds or be, suit or be certified by a community-based organization. The unmanned aircraft must not interfere with manned aircraft. There must be coordination with airports if you're nearby, and the aircraft must be flown within visual sight. This whole hobby versus commercial distinction is really very controversial. And the way it came about was, uh, as I said, there's a long history of uh, model aircraft users, model aircraft flyers flying very responsibly uh, for a long period of time. They've been doing this uh, you know, without incident. And when Congress began to talk about regulating drones, this community uh, essentially said, wait a second, we can govern ourselves. We've done a good job of that. We don't need any additional guidelines. And Congress agreed. And in the 2012 FAA Modernization and Reform Act, Congress directed the FAA to promulgate regulations addressing, addressing the commercial use of, uh, of drones, but not to, address, not to create any regulations that would restrict the use of model aircraft and made it clear that model aircraft would only uh, be penalized if there were some sort of careless operation. The problem with that is that many, many users began to do what were really commercial operations but tried very hard to categorize their use as model aircraft. And so the line between model aircraft and commercial use has become blurred, forcing the FAA to come out with these very specific guidelines about what constitutes hobby or commercial use. And it's really gotten to the point now where if you have to ask whether or not what you're doing is a hobby or commercial use, it's commercial use. Uh, if there's any uncertainty, the FAA is almost certainly going to call it commercial use. You know if you're a model aircraft flyer, and if you're not sure, then you're probably not. And, and uh, if you're really not sure, uh, feel free to give uh, me a call, and I'll help you work that out. This is a, very, uh, a fairly new development in the law, and uh, drone registration. For a long time, ever since the triple three process has been in effect, in other words, ever since the FAA has started allowing commercial operation, they've required that any pilot operating a drone commercially register that drone the same way that they would register a manned aircraft. They have to get what we call an N number and put that on their aircraft. But recently, in fact, just before Christmas of last year, the FAA has said that they want to be able to identify all of the users of hobby aircraft as well. And so they put a registration process into effect. And this is basically what it says. Um, first of all, it requires the user to register, uh, not the aircraft. And so whereas under commercial guidelines, each individual aircraft must have its own number, under hobby guidelines, the hobby user receives a user number and then affixes that same number to all of their aircraft. Uh, this applies to any unmanned aircraft weighing between 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds, which covers a very wide spectrum of drones. There are some small uh, toy level uh, aircraft that weigh less than half a pound that are generally flown inside that won't fit within this category, but most of what we think of as unmanned aircraft are going to fit within 0.55 to 55 pounds. Uh, as I've said, commercial users register the aircraft, hobby users register themselves. This is an online process. Uh, it's, it's fairly easy to do, uh, but the information does become public. There's a legal challenge pending now to this process. Uh, it's actually a pro se legal challenge by a lawyer who's also a model aircraft enthusiast. This is Taylor versus FAA. Essentially, this case alleges that the drone registration requirements violate Section 336 of the FAA Modernization and Reform Act. And that's because Section 336 states that the FAA may not promulgate any rule or regulation regarding a model aircraft. Um, as I've already noted, Section 336 does not limit the authority to pursue enforcement against careless operators. The FAA has argued um, and did argue when they came out with this rule that what 336 really means is that they can't uh, promulgate any rules for model aircraft 
that they don't also have for commercial aircraft, they can't, that they can't treat model aircraft differently, and that this isn't treating model aircraft any differently. We'll have to see how that works out. Um, right now, the rule is that all drones have to be registered uh, within the next, I think it's approximately 30 days. I want to say the deadline is mid, uh, mid-February. Uh, but uh, as I said, this lawsuit is pending, and we'll have to see what happens with it. Uh, you cannot register a commercial aircraft with the, on the online system yet, but the FAA has said that that might become possible in the future. The next thing to discuss is uh, certificate of authorization. So uh, this is also known as a COA. It's a certificate of authorization or a waiver. There are really two ways this term is used. Uh, one is in conjunction with a commercial use application or a 333 application. Uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about here. What I'm talking about here are COAs for uh, public aircraft operations or government functions. This is a, a, a way to use unmanned aircraft that's really underutilized at this point. Um, it's uh, Public entities are authorized to obtain certificates of authorization from the FAA to use drones as public aircraft to perform government functions. And um, some entities are doing that. The city of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, uh, Mesa, Arizona, Grand Forks, North Dakota are all some examples of cities that have gone through this process. Um, if you have a relationship with, uh, with a municipality or with a state, with a government agency, I highly recommend that you look into this. Uh, it's, it's a different process than the triple three commercial process. It actually allows uh, a broader range of operations. It's a little bit easier to, to operate under, but you must be performing a government function, such as law enforcement, search and rescue, uh, emergency response. Uh, there are a number, a number of other um, wildlife surveys, uh, a lot of possible uses. And um, this generally uh, is not, not terribly complicated. It's something that we do for our clients. It's not, not terribly expensive, especially in light of the fact that this can bring aerial assets to communities that otherwise could not afford them. Uh, it's much less expensive to implement a drone program for a city that could never implement a helicopter program, for example. Uh, another key element of the certificate of authorization process is that it can be contracted. So. It's possible for uh, a city or state government to receive a COA from the FAA for the public use of drones and then to contract that service to a private entity, even if the private entity has not obtained its own commercial use certification because the private contractor is operating under the government COA and they're operating a public aircraft. This is a great opportunity for private drone operators to, uh, to make some money to get some experience and to provide a valuable government function uh, for various municipal entities. So uh, I really urge you not to forget about the COA process. It's not talked about that much, but it's really um, uh, potentially very, very useful and a good way to, to, again, bring services to municipalities that cannot otherwise use them. That brings us to the exemption process. And this right now is really the number one way for operators to, to legally get unmanned aircraft into the skies. Section 333 of the 2012 uh, FAA Modernization and Reform Act uh, is the provision that allows for the use of commercial unmanned aircraft. As I've said, uh, unmanned aircraft currently cannot be used in the national airspace without uh, specific FAA authorization. And the reason for that is there's really no way for an unmanned aircraft to comply with all of the existing provisions of the federal aviation regulations. It can't be done. I mean, just as a, a very basic example, uh, the FARs require an operating manual to be um, on board an aircraft. Well, obviously, an unmanned aircraft isn't going to have the operating manuals on board, and that's just one small example. Uh, and so what the FAA has said uh, from the direction of Congress is that if the secretary determines that unmanned aircraft systems may operate safely in the national airspace system, then the secretary shall establish requirements for the operation of those aircraft. What this means is that on a case-by-case -case basis, companies or individuals can apply to the FAA to say, I want to do commercial operations. Here's how I'm going to do them. And the FAA can come back to them and say, yes, uh, we give you permission to conduct commercial operations under very specific circumstances. And as long as you comply with those, uh, you're, you're fine to begin your operations. Um, this started slowly. 
But at this point, there are uh, 2,500 to maybe even 3,000 uh, Section 333 exemptions that have been granted. Uh, our firm has done a lot of those for various clients. Successfully, we have firms, we have clients that are currently operating under a Section 333 exemption. And although the exemptions have a lot of limitations, they um, are really the, the only way to get into this game right now, or, or really one of the only ways to get into the game. And what I like to tell people is even though you're limited in what you can do under Section 333, it's a chance to at least begin to establish some, uh, some expertise, uh, to establish some policies and procedures, and to get ahead of other uh, competitors uh, in, within the drone space. Uh, I should mention here that right now under Section 333, uh, some of the requirements that the FAA is insisting on are, uh, for example, the operator of the aircraft has to be a licensed pilot. That's a big deal for a lot of people. That's a really a deal killer for some people. But that is an absolute unwaivable requirement right now. The operator of the drone must be a licensed pilot. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you have to be a licensed pilot to get a triple three. Uh, it's, it just means that once you obtain that triple three, a requirement is going to be that a licensed pilot fly the aircraft. Uh, and that's important to bear in mind. Uh, also, right now, the FAA is requiring that all operations under uh, Section 333 be line of sight, uh, that they be daylight only, uh, and that they be below 400 feet. Uh, they're also issuing what they call a blanket certificate of authorization, which means that if you have a 333 exemption, you can fly anywhere in the uh, United States as long as you're below 200 feet and specified distances from airports. If the user wants to fly closer to airports or higher than that, they have to go back to the FAA for additional permission. The FAA has implemented what they call their Pathfinder program. Uh, they're working with industry partners uh, to work out ways to expand the, the, the different parameters uh, in which UAVs can be operated under 333 or in the future under uh, the small UAV rules. Three examples are uh, CNN is working uh, with the FAA at how the aircraft can be used safely in populated areas. Uh, Precision Hawk is working on extended visual line of sight in rural areas, particularly for crop monitoring. And Burlington Northern is working on beyond visual line of sight in rural and isolated areas um, to inspect rail systems. Uh, I've spoken with the Pathfinder program managers recently. I understand that there are a couple of additional companies that are involved now, but I also understand that they're not currently looking for additional partners. Uh, I think that's unfortunate, uh, but there are other ways to, uh, to test new technologies and capabilities, for example, at one of the designated FAA test sites. And that's a way for companies to begin to establish procedures that might push the boundaries of what the FAA would otherwise permit, uh, and then allow them to get permission for those operations. So as I mentioned, um, back in February uh, of, of 2015, the FAA came out with its notice of proposed rulemaking. And uh, these are the rules that the FAA has said they intend to implement with regard to the commercial use of small unmanned systems, unmanned aircraft systems. Those are systems under 55 pounds. The comment period has closed uh, for those proposed rules, and we're now waiting for the final rulemaking, for the final rules to be released. The FAA has, st has stated that they expect those to be released by June. Uh, I'm skeptical of that. Uh, they've missed a number of deadlines already. But... Uh, that's what we're hearing is by June. It could very well be uh, a year or longer, uh, but uh, June is the target right now. And, and here's what they're proposing. Um, first, there are certain specific requirements for UAV operators. And uh, these are, are really uh, a relief to a lot of people because they do not require that a UAV operator have a manned aircraft license, as they have to now. Uh, instead, the operator would be required to pass an initial aeronautical knowledge test, to be vetted by the TSA, to obtain an unmanned aircraft operator certificate with a small UAS rating. This is like an existing pilot airman certificate. Pass a recurrent aeronautical knowledge test every 24 months, be 17 years old, provide their records for inspection, report accidents, and finally, conduct pre-flight inspections prior to flight. This pre-flight inspection requirement is interesting because this is in lieu of any sort of airworthiness certification for the aircraft itself. Uh, 
there was a lot of uh, debate about whether or not the FAA was going to require that unmanned aircraft be um, certified as airworthy, the way manned aircraft typically are. And what the FAA has indicated is that they will not have that kind of requirement. Instead, they will simply require that the operators conduct a pre-flight inspection. Um, a lot of people, including myself, think that could be problematic. Uh, you know, the average operator isn't going to have a lot of technical knowledge necessarily and isn't going to probably be able to tell from pre-flight inspection uh, how well engineered and designed an aircraft is. So, um, you know, this allows the, the development of small manufacturers because an airworthiness certification would be quite a burden, but I think it may uh, allow people to fly aircraft which aren't necessarily airworthy. The proposed rules will allow the use of a visual observer. Uh, that's not in lieu of the operator, and, but uh, a visual observer can be used to help maintain uh, visual line of sight with the aircraft. But the operator is always going to have to maintain visual line of sight with the unmanned aircraft under the proposed rules. The unmanned aircraft must remain below 500 feet at all times and must yield to manned aircraft at all times. Operations will only be permitted during daylight hours. So these requirements are similar to what's being required under Section 333 right now, but um, once this proposed rule comes into effect, everyone will know what the rules are, and uh, if you're flying within the terms of those rules, presumably operations will no longer require a triple three exemption. The next thing to talk about briefly is state law. And most states now, the majority of states, have imposed their own specific unmanned aircraft laws. Uh, that's creating a lot of confusion, a lot of difficulty, a lot of pushback from uh, operators as well as from the FAA. Uh, the FAA recently came out with a policy statement urging the states to kind of uh, stay in their lane, uh, talking about some of the preemption issues and why states should not be trying to govern national airspace. Nonetheless, states are trying to get into this game, and many have. Uh, many state legislators want to show that they're concerned about unmanned aircraft and that they're taking steps to regulate them. Uh, in addition to um, the regulation of civilian aircraft, which I'll get into in a minute, um, there's been uh, a fair amount of law enforcement use of unmanned aircraft, and uh, a lot of laws have been passed restricting the use of unmanned aircraft. Uh, so I've previously done a separate presentation about law enforcement use of drones. Uh, the next several slides are taken from that presentation, and I'm going to run through them very quickly to give you an overview of law enforcement use. But I should say, really, the law enforcement use of drones is a standalone presentation and, and really could be its own discussion. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the extent of deployment of drones in law enforcement, about some of the state statutes that govern the law enforcement use of drones, and about some case law that has developed over the years in relation to manned aircraft that can apply to unmanned aircraft. So uh, drones have been uh, deployed fairly extensively by law enforcement. Uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has their own predator drones that they use domestically and that they actually loan out to local law enforcement upon request. Uh, there was a fairly recent Freedom of Information Act request uh, trying to find out who Customs and Border Protection has shared their predator with. Uh, among the different agencies that were disclosed are uh, the FBI, uh, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the United States Marshal Service, the Coast Guard, and then maybe more surprisingly, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the Texas Department of Public Safety. This is not a, a, a complete list, but this shows you that even local law enforcement can obtain the use of predator UAVs for local law enforcement surveillance, and I think that comes as a surprise to a lot of people. Um, not too long ago, we had the first unmanned aircraft systems supported arrest. Uh, this made a lot of news when it happened. Uh, Rodney Brossert uh, was engaged in a 16-hour armed standoff with, uh, with law enforcement. Uh, the SWAT team called in a Predator drone. The drone located Brossert and surveilled him and let police know when it was time, uh, when it was safe to come in and make an arrest. There is a lot of public resistance to the use of drones or unmanned aircraft. 
Uh, and um, one example of this is uh, in Seattle, um, uh, about a year ago, the Seattle Police UAV program ended um, because they had so much uh, public resistance. They purchased vehicles, they received a lot of public opposition, and uh, then they had to figure out what to do with those unmanned aircraft. So what they did was they sent them to the LAPD. Um, the LAPD acquired a small uh, pair of small drones from the Seattle Police Department. Um, LA, as of uh, November 16, 2014, had not deployed the drones. And uh, the, as of the date of this article, they were still in the box. So this is a common problem. Uh, police, uh, government obtain drones, and then either they get a lot of public pu pushback or they haven't taken the necessary steps to get FAA approval for flight. And that goes back to the COA process that I discussed. Uh, a lot of agencies will purchase their, drones, purchase their drones before they've gone through the approval process, which is uh, putting, doing things a little bit backward. It's important to get uh, a COA, that is federal authorization for drone use, before you buy your aircraft. Uh, as of about a year ago, 20 states had enacted laws addressing UAS. Uh, there are more now. Uh, typically, uh, under the various state laws, law enforcement must obtain a warrant before they use their drones. But there are some interesting exceptions. Uh, in Tennessee, for example, those drones can be used for, uh, to respond to terrorist attacks, for emergencies, search and rescue, or when there's an authorized exception uh, to the warrant requirement, which is a typical uh, provision of the law, that you can't use the drone for law enforcement unless there's an exception to the warrant requirement, which there often will be. Um, very briefly, I'll mention that, uh, as many of you know, uh, the Fourth Amendment is what protects uh, citizens from unreasonable searches and seizures absent uh, a warrant or probable cause. Um, there are many traditional exceptions to the warrant requirement. Um, perhaps most importantly in the field of unmanned aircraft are the plain view exceptions, which are usually um, uh, views from the air. So a lot of laws developed regarding plain view, that is, uh, items that can be seen by the flying public. Some of the cases uh, back in 1986, uh, most of the cases seem to revolve around viewing uh, marijuana from the air. And back in 1986, the Supreme Court said that the, there is no reasonable expectation of privacy into what can be seen by the uh, general flying public um, if they're readily discernible to the naked eye. That law expanded uh, really uh, pretty quickly to include um, vision enhancement as long as the uh, electronic devices couldn't penetrate walls and were commonly available. Um, that continued to expand uh, with a low-flying helicopter um, where the uh, Supreme Court again said uh, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy and what can be seen from a low-flying helicopter. Um, maybe things would have been different if the helicopter had been violating federal law, but it was flying where it was allowed to fly so um, there was no reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, this uh, case law kind of retreated a little bit um, when the Supreme Court said that sense-enhancing technology that allows you to see what cannot otherwise be seen uh, is no longer plain view, but the case there was really based on the fact that the sense-enhancing technology was not generally available. Uh, a lot of technology available now on drones is widely available, and so it leaves some question about how the Supreme Court would interpret uh, those cases today. So there's no reasonable expectation of privacy when something is observable by the flying public using equipment generally available in compliance with law and regulations, and there's no sense-enhancing technology revealing the interior. That is the current state of the law in regard to um, viewing from aircraft. And uh, that law really um, is going to have to be addressed again because uh, drones are so ubiquitous, so available to the flying public, are, are so technologically advanced uh, that the law that developed around helicopters and airplanes doesn't really make quite the same sense necessarily when you're talking about drones. Let's talk quickly about uh, one of the states that is leading the nation in terms of drone laws. And when I say that, I mean in terms of the quantity of drone laws. Uh, Tennessee has a lot of laws specifically addressing the use of unmanned aircraft. A great example here is that Tennessee has redefined its criminal trespass statute. 
Uh, enter now means when a person causes an unmanned aircraft to enter that portion of the airspace above the owner's land, not regulated as navigable airspace by the FAA. Uh, this provision is interesting because no one knows what uh, portion of the airspace above the owner's land is or is not regulated as navigable airspace by the FAA. This is the subject of, of current litigation that we're going to talk about. But um, it's interesting that Tennessee saw fit to expand their trespass statute that way. And so it's a Class C misdemeanor to trespass using a drone. It's also a Class C misdemeanor to conduct video surveillance of private citizens who are lawfully hunting or fishing in Tennessee. Uh, this seems ripe for a First Amendment challenge. And uh, we'll see if anyone uh, does take a video of a hunter or fisherman in Tennessee and gets prosecuted, how that shakes out. I'd, I'd love to hear about it if it happens. Tennessee has um, basically uh, said that it is lawful to use a drone to capture an image for very specific purposes, which you see listed here, um, but that it is generally unlawful to conduct surveillance on private property, uh, to fly a drone over an open-air ticketed event of 100 people, to fly a drone near fireworks or over jails, although destro destroying the footage without distribution is a defense to those, uh, those potential crimes. This brings us to the Supremacy Clause. I've sort of mentioned this in passing a couple of times already. Uh, it's been very well established for a long time, uh, ever since manned aviation has become well established, that Congress um, has uh, sole authority and exclusive jurisdiction over navigable airspace, and that states are preempted from passing laws that um, deal with uh, aircraft safety or where aircraft can fly. And so it brings up a question very quickly about whether or not state laws addressing the use of drones uh, are preempted under the Supremacy Clause. And, and as a brief review of that, the Supremacy Clause comes into effect in three possible ways. Uh, there can be express language uh, in, a, in a statute saying that it preempts all um, state laws. There can be conflict preemption when it is impossible for a private party to comply with both federal and state requirements. And there can be field preemption when, when um, a regulatory scheme is so, per, so pervasive that it basically evidences an intent to occupy the entire field. Uh, as a general statement, uh, the field of aviation regulation is subject to field preemption. Uh, but there's a lot of case law surrounding this, and there certainly are some ways that drones can be regulated by the state that are not subject to preemption, but many are. And uh, this is complicated and, and really has been the subject of a lot of law review articles and a lot of analysis and um, will need to continue to be examined as more state laws are passed. I want to touch on this very briefly. I want to make sure I leave some time to answer your questions. But as I've mentioned, uh, there's really it, no one really knows where private property ends and where the national airspace begins and what constitutes a trespass by a drone or an invasion of privacy by a drone. So really, there's been no case law uh, to date to develop that uh, answer. So uh, there's a case called Boggs versus Meredith, with which our firm recently filed in the Western District of Kentucky. Uh, in brief, Meredith shot down Boggs' drone. Uh, it was flying over Meredith's property. Meredith was charged by Kentucky uh, prosecutors for unlawful discharge of a firearm and reckless endangerment. The Kentucky judge dismissed the criminal case against Meredith, saying Meredith had the right to shoot down the drone. And we've now filed a case, uh, declaratory judgment action uh, in federal court, asking to clarify the boundaries of federal airspace and private property, and um, also asking for damages to Mr. Boggs's drone. Uh, if you want to learn more about this case, just go ahead and Google Boggs Meredith uh, and my name, Boggs Meredith Mackler. And you'll get uh, lots of links uh, to the case and a lot of news stories, and it's really very interesting to read. Meredith has not filed his answer yet to the criminal complaint. Our firm can help clients in the drone field a number of ways. We can help to navigate FAA regulations, apply for triple three exemptions, help register your aircraft, and help government entities obtain certificates of authorization. These are all things we've done and will continue to do. Uh, we can help. Uh, businesses to comply with state laws, both criminal statutes and um, basically uh, avoid civil liability. We can and do help with due diligence when hiring drones. Many of our clients don't want to conduct their own drone program, but they want to be able to evaluate the qualifications of 
uh, people flying drones in support of their businesses. And we provide the ancillary services, such as intellectual property, capital raise, business planning, and litigation that can all arise around the use of drones. So um, I've been talking nonstop for about 45 minutes now. I'm going to uh, see if anyone has, has posted any questions uh, to the um, website here. So um, I'm trying to look at the questions that we've got here. Uh, there's a question that someone asked, what about um, photos or videos placed on an AMA-sanctioned club's website for members or the viewing public? Well, you know, if the videos uh, or the photos were taken by someone flying uh, fully in compliance with the hobby guidelines, that is, they weren't flown with any intent uh, to, to make any money, and uh, if, the club webs if the club itself is not going to uh, be able to make, is, is not making money from the publication of those, uh, those videos, then arguably that's not going to violate the commercial use uh, provisions. But if, to take the other side of that, if I was the FAA, I might say, look, the club is publishing these, uh, these videos for, promotion, for really to increase their membership, and um, I, that might be akin to posting on YouTube. So um, it's a bit of a close call to me. Um, the FAA is being very, very strict about how they're interpreting commercial use. And so uh, I think that there's a risk that that would be considered commercial use, although that's really a bit of a stretch. Um, let's see. Uh, another question here is um, someone asks, will... Uh, triple threes, will the 333 exemptions still be needed after the final rules come into effect? Well, um, the answer to that is yes. Um, the triple three process is always going to be required whenever someone wants to fly outside of the bounds of current uh, federal aviation regulations. So right now, the triple three process is being used for all commercial use because there are no regulations that permit commercial use. Once we have uh, regulations governing the use of small unmanned aircraft, there will certainly still be flyers, operators, who want to fly outside of those parameters, who want to fly at night or beyond line of sight or higher, uh, and just as some examples. And so those, those operators are still going to need uh, a triple three exemption. Um, I'd also note that, um, you know, related to that, people ask me if, they, if it's even you know, if the people who've applied for and received triple three exemptions today um, are going to benefit somehow or need those once the final rules do come into effect. And my assumption is that if you've been flying pursuant to a triple three, when the final rules come into effect, you'll have a competitive advantage having flown legally for some period of time prior to those final rules and will have all of your policies and procedures in effect. Um, there won't, and, and therefore should have an easier time transitioning into uh, the commercial industry. Um, let's see, another question here. Um, can commercial users take advantage of online registration? No, uh, not at this time. The FAA indicated that the online registration process will be available uh, to commercial users. Right now, it's only available to hobby users. Uh, something about that, and that's that's too bad because uh, the commercial registration process is really extremely difficult. Um, it's cumbersome. It's based on uh, on carbon copy forms, and it takes a lot of time to do. And so my clients who are having to go through that process all wish that they could register online, uh, but they can't right now. Let's see. Another question I have here is, um, this is a question I get asked a lot. Uh, what can I do if someone flies over my property without permission? Uh, well, depending on the state you're in, flying over your property may be considered trespass. Uh, it may, there may actually be a statute that governs it, as there is in Tennessee. There may also be statutes um, addressing issues like peeping toms or invasion of privacy that could apply. Um, if a drone just simply flies over your property and continues going, I mean, I, I wouldn't really be concerned about that. Uh, if an unmanned aircraft is you know, hovering over your property and, and appears to be 
uh, conducting surveillance. I think the right thing to do is to call the police and have them investigate. Uh, I, I would say that it is not a good idea to shoot down the drone. I know that can be tempting, and as, uh, as I mentioned, we're representing someone who was shot down. I understand that happened not long ago, again, in Texas, and it's happened one or two times before. Uh, but there are authorized reasons to be flying unmanned aircraft. Um, it could be involved in a search and rescue operation, just for example. Um, furthermore, when you shoot at a drone, you're creating a hazard for everyone around. Uh, that aircraft is going to come down if you hit it, uh, and um, uh, you're shooting in the air. So uh, I, I would I would say it's I advise against uh, shooting down an aircraft that's flying over your property. Uh, I believe that that aircraft, depending on where it is, is probably in federal airspace as well, uh, navigable airspace. Uh, another question that just came in here is, um, let's see. How can we find out what our state laws are for drones over flying our property? That's a related question. Um, you know, I think the, the fastest way might be to, to Google, uh, again, uh, drones, uh, drone and trespass. But if you give us a call, we can, we can find that answer for you. Our firm has conducted a 50-state survey. Uh, we're very familiar with the laws in every state in relation to drones, and so we can, we can help you sort that question out. Uh, as, as there are... There are, as I've said, a lot of state laws that really cover that, even if they don't specifically cover drones anyway. I don't see any more written questions. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, honestly, if you'll have the ability to ask questions, uh, you know, verbally uh, over the, this webinar. Uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye out, though, for another minute for any more written questions before I sign off and uh, encourage you, uh, even afterward, to call me or email me or tweet any questions, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer those. Okay, well, seeing no additional questions and, and uh, hearing no additional questions, uh, I'll go ahead and, uh, and sign off. Thank you all very much for your attendance. Oh, wait, someone wanted to get something at the last, last minute. Um, what provisions are there that currently cover sporting events? Great question. So um, there are a number of provisions that currently cover sporting events. Anytime there's a, uh, a sporting event at a stadium, that can hold 30,000 or more people, the Federal Aviation Administration puts a temporary flight restriction into effect, banning all aircraft from flying over that stadium, including unmanned aircraft. A uh, violation of a temporary flight restriction is a criminal offense and can also subject someone to civil pen penalties. So that's the first thing. Um, Tennessee has passed a statute that says that it's illegal to fly over ticketed events of 100 or more people without permission of the um, without permission of the, the venue owner. So uh, that's another provision that governs that. And that um, doesn't apply uh, in every state because that's a Tennessee-specific uh, statute. But uh, again, also that could constitute trespass. So um, that's important to, it's important to know of the state-by-state -state rules. Um, but the biggest ones are the, the large events uh, that are regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. Again, that's a question I'm happy to answer for if there's a particular sporting event or a particular need. Um, uh, this is a, uh, another person asks, what are the necessary steps I need to take if I wanted to use a drone for construction aerial photos? Uh, the, what you're going to need to do is obtain a 333 exemption from the FAA. I have a number of clients that have done that for this purpose. Uh, that's something that uh, our law firm can do for you. It's not, uh, it, it, it doesn't take a very long time to uh, get that done and get it submitted. It will take three to four months probably to get FAA approval, though, after it is submitted. Uh, but I highly encourage you to, to go through that process. Um, like I said, the FAA has granted many of those applications, and uh, we can not only get you the um, 333 approval, but provide you with the guidance about how to comply with that 
Um, the other way is for you as a, uh, if, if you own a construction company, for example, and want to obtain aerial photos from drones, is to contract that service out to an outside provider, in which case we can help you vet, find and vet uh, those outside providers to make sure that they are complying with the FAA requirements and with state law. Because if you contract with someone who's violating the law, and again, if there's an incident and they don't have insurance coverage, uh, then the person who's, who's uh, engaged in that service, the person who asked for that service is probably going to be on the hook for any kind of liability. Okay. Um, and if I don't see anything else in the next couple of, uh, of moments, I'll go ahead and, and log out, but I encourage you to ask any other questions if you have them. All right, I'll say it again. You've got my email address, uh, my uh, Twitter handle, and my phone number. Uh, please uh, feel free to reach out with any additional questions or concerns, and uh, I'm happy to help you. Thank you all so much for your attendance and your, uh, uh, and your attention, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Take care.